Welcome to In the Background of Life with Kelly Ramsey, the podcast that invites you to sit down in a cozy living space, sipping a cup of tea while we embark on a captivating journey about our intentional narratives in our lives. I'm Kelly Ramsey, and this podcast is your warm space to unravel the stories woven into everyday moments. It's a tapestry crafted with intention and purpose. So grab your favorite cup of tea, settle in, and let's explore the unnoticed details that contribute to the intentional design of the world around us. Together, we'll celebrate the beauty in the threads that make life extraordinary. Hi, welcome back. We are continuing our conversation about summer fun and balancing work. And as promised, I'm going to be sharing with you a book that I picked up at the library during our library visit, and also a few things about balancing your work life while the children are at home. So I want to start with a story about a time in our family vacation. And this was um, a while ago, but I think it's significant learnings that we had during this particular family vacation. So as you know, I am the mom of two boys, and so we are raising them to be adventurous and to take risks. And sometimes we try those things out when we're on vacation and doing different things. And so I remember um, as we were driving, we were driving to California. That's one of our, was one of our summer trips. It's a long drive, 24 hours is the drive. So we stop in between um, to get rest so we don't drive straight. And then my husband and I swap driving. Now, one thing that's exciting this summer, we have a third driver. And so wherever we go, we'll have three drivers instead of two. So that can be both fun and also a little adventurous because they're just learning to be on the road. It's Driving on the road is very different on the highway than driving on the road every day. And so that'll be something that we're looking forward to. But I remember on this particular vacation, um, we were headed um, to California and the boys were younger. They were two and four years old. And so it's a lot to be in the car for adults, right? So imagine a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And so we're driving along. They have all their creature comforts. We always travel with lots of stuff. Like we're not your minimalist family, everybody with their one bag and there's space for your um, feet in the back seat. No, we're the family that everything is packed in, every space, every crevice is filled. We reset it when we stop. And then when we get to our destination, our family is always like, did you guys bring the whole house? Yes, we did, because they're creature comforts that we like. And so that's what we do. And so I remember um, being in the back seat because we had shifted and my um, son was uh, a little bit older. So he was riding in the front for a minute. And so sitting in the back seat with my two-year-old, I learned all kind of new things about him, what he liked, what he didn't like, and conversation. And at that time, he had a speech impediment. And so I was really honing in, listening to what he was saying, but also amazed at how much progress he had been making. And as I was sitting there in the back seat, I thought I would have missed this opportunity had I not switched places and sat right here. And I thought about how much are we missing as parents in the day-to-day -day life when we don't slow down enough to have those moments where we learn something new about our children. They're ever growing and ever developing. And we're so busy caretaking, sometimes we forget just to hang out with them. And so at, after that um, sitting time, I decided for the rest of the trip, I was going to spend time with each of them and discover something new about who they were. And I remember distinctly um, one of my boys uh, loved Cars, right? Cars the movie. He watched all the episodes, right? And so we got to this spot in Arizona 
And he was like, Mom, look, that's where Lightning McQueen was there with Doc, and he was showing him how to win the race. I was like, I don't think so. But then I looked at the area, and I was like, this really does look like the spot. And so from then on, we started to talk about Cars and Mater and all the characters and what it might have been like to um, be there and to do all those things. And so those were memory making, right? So fast forward, the boys are older. We're driving again that stint from California to Oklahoma. And we were always notorious for trying to get to our destination, And I said, this trip, I said, I don't care what we're doing. It's going to take a little bit more time, but we're going to stop at the Grand Canyon. And my husband was like, do we have time? We have plenty of time. We're on vacation. We don't have to be back. We're going to stop at the Grand Canyon. So we stop at the Grand Canyon and uh, we'll get a good night's sleep. So we make it there. So we get a hotel, we get a good night's sleep and we get, uh, you know, how you get a alarm for um, the weather, like in Oklahoma. So this alarm goes off while we're sleeping, and it's alarm that a bear is on the loose in the area. And we're like, oh, my God, what do you do? Like, when a bear is on the loose, what do you do? And so, of course, we stayed in, but all night long we're thinking, like, where is the bear at? You know, how long has he been? Has he ravaged things? And all of these this imagery started to come up for that. But what a memory for the boys as we're going, driving up to the Grand Canyon, getting out of the car, looking at all of this wonder and um, just really spending time and being there together. And so I have one picture where my youngest is on my oldest back and they're just cheesing and having brother time. And it was because we made the decision to stop and we made the decision to pause So I would encourage you, as you're on your trips this summer with family vacations, be it a long trip or a short trip, make the time to connect with your children in new ways and then watch what comes ahead. So one of the things that we could do around that was that because we planned ahead, we knew what we wanted to see and we knew what time we had. And so we planned for that destination and all of the family members were able to enjoy it. So you're you're planning for your destinations, not by one person's likes, but something that everybody can enjoy. And even if they don't enjoy every part of the trip, they should have something that's particularly theirs that they do enjoy. And so we always, food is always a center part of our vacations as well. And so as my children have gotten older, We will do Pacific food places that we've looked up that we want to go visit or go and eat at. And so we've done that as well. But be sure to include everyone. So some are not interested in all of the extrovert activities. Some want to sit at a corner, read a book. Be sure there's a space for them to do that. And so there's a a balance to that work. So as you're thinking about those, um, those things, also think about the travel tools that you need as you're traveling. Be sure that you pack the essentials for the family. I share with you that our family packs all the things and those are essential for us. So make sure it looks like what you need for your children. And then also plan your rest breaks. So even if it's like a schedule, you have one person that's a scheduler and they're like, we're only stopping at this stop and whatnot. And then you have people like me who are like, oh, that looks interesting. Let's pull over and let's go see, right? So you want to plan what those stops might look like. And so you know what's coming next. In our family, Starbucks is always a must in the morning. So we are plotting out where the nearest Starbucks is because we got to get our Starbucks fixed. And so that's a part of our planning. And then we always use the map tool on our phones So that even if we know we've been this path before and what direction we're going, we know like what the stops are, where the gas is, where is restaurants. And so the mapping tool helps you to do that. And then charge up your um, devices for sure, because you're going to need them for the long haul. And then during our trip, sometimes we will have device, like no device hour, 30 minutes or whatnot. And we're doing like car games. So 
um, naming all the red cards, yellow cards, or whatever the card games. We make them up, so there's no rule to them, but we will do that just for connection. And then we also like to do what we call story story time rounds. So one part person starts the story, the next person gives the next part, and so on, and we just do rounds. And we're cracking up laughing by the end because we've created this like horrendous story, but all of us were involved and you really see the creativity and the imagination that comes forth in that. So those are some of our summer fun um, activities. So I promised you last um, on the last podcast to share with you the book that I picked up at the library. If you didn't re- listen to the last podcast, one of the things I was encouraging is to get reacquainted with your public library and how we used to use that as a routine with my boys since they were infants and they still are book lovers and readers and avid readers. But recently I reacquainted myself with the library because I have been been a reader since I was a little girl. And so I grew up in Oakland in the Berkeley area And my sisters and I would take our trips to the library every two weeks to check out our books. One of the funnest parts of that, and I'm going to date myself, was going to the card catalog. Some people are like, what is a card catalog? So it was this humongous wood um, piece of furniture with little drawers that you pull out the card for the book. So in the front of every book, now you don't see these because they're uh, outdated. Now everything is electronic. But in the front of every book was a card that told you the title, when it was published, who had checked it out. You used to actually sign out on the card of who had checked it out, where the book had been, right? And so I love going to the card catalog in the adult section, even though I was a teenager, uh, to look and peruse different books and different topics. And then I would go downstairs to the children's area and meet up with my sisters and read the big adult books that I had bought. And then eventually my sisters were like, well, we want to go upstairs too. And so they would join me. I would show them how to go and navigate it. And then um, that began our love for our books and reading. So recently, I went and checked out books. I always have the same pattern. I want to look at the new books and releases and what's available. I want to look at books about gardening, about crafting, specifically quilting and embroidery are my two favorites. I'm going to look at black fiction and the writers I like to follow, who I'm going to mention today. One of them was Zora Neale Hurston. And then I'm going to look at some up-and-coming fiction. Over the years, my fiction books have changed, but usually I'm trying to get something related to all of those hobbies that I just mentioned. So when I was in the library in the new section, um, I saw a book by Gretchen Rubin. So Gretchen Rubin is the author of Life in Five Senses. She talks about how exploring the senses got me out of my head and into the world. At the beginning of the book, she talks about going to the eye doctor and discovering that she had um, some, uh, some loss in her vision. And that visit to the eye doctor got her to thinking about what happens when we don't pay attention to our body and to the senses in our body. So as we began to read into the book, she quoted a few things but I'm going to read a little section and then share with you my thoughts on it. So she's talking about the five senses that send us streams of reports, yet human world is only partly concrete. concrete. Unlike animals, we experience a universe transformed by imagination, and we exist within a cloud of thoughts such as what if, and they're talking about me, And this is holy. A dog doesn't gaze into a waterfall. When we look, we see more than our eyes show us. So we just imagine that we've gazed into this waterfall. We're probably feeling some of the water if we're close enough. We're seeing it. We're hearing the sound of the waterfall. 
And we're also experiencing, what if I went and stood under the waterfall? What would it feel like on my head, on my body, right? And so we're never just looking at something. We're always digging deeper with all of our senses to explore it. So she goes on to say, and of course, we each live in our own body, the one assigned to us by fate and shaped by our history. My senses would show me a different world if I were 10 years old, pregnant, a smoker, a bird watcher, are in a bad mood, or if I spoke a tonal language, had a genetic variation related to the olfactory receptor gene OR6A2. I have no idea what that is, but or if I had suffered through a bad night with tequila in college. As the writer Zornel Hurston observed, this was the quote that stood out to me. She says, every man's spice box seasons his own food. Just think about that for a minute. Every man's spice box seasons his own food. I get to determine not only what I glance at or look at, but I also get to determine how I'm going to take it in, how I'm going to respond to it. And so when I think about my season box that's being seasoned, that's seasoning my own food, I think about what would I want to have. So if you are a foodie like me, I like lots of seasonings and lots of different things, right? And so when I'm experiencing something, I want to taste it on all the different levels. And it reminded me as I read that, that we get to create what that looks like. That took me all the way back to being a preschool teacher, working with my children. And one of my lessons that I always gave out was that if I could touch all five of their senses, they could have the most deep learning about a topic. And so one of the things, one of the activities I always did every year was to pop popcorn with an air popper, right? We still have those. I have one in my house. So it's not microwave popcorn, put it in the microwave and be done with it, but it's the act of the air pop. So I would set out a white sheet on the carpet. I would put the air popper in the middle and it wasn't plugged in. We would look at the corn kernels and I would give the kids a few of them to look at in the field and whatnot. And then we would drop them into the air popper, put the top on, and then we would plug it in. Then we would ask the kids, close your eyes. And they would close their eyes and they're like, what did you hear? And they started to think about like the popcorn dropping and then it's like popping. And as it popped, just imagine these two-year-olds, as it popped, they would jump with each pop. Because they were like, oh, I felt that, right? And so they're experiencing it. And then I was like, and what do you smell? And they're like, I smell popcorn, right? And so then they started to smell it and it filled the room. I said, now open your eyes and what do you see? And they would see the popcorn on the sheet that had been popping out. And so I would turn it off, unplug it, and then they each would go and grab a piece of popcorn And I would say, now hold it until you get back to your seat. So they were feeling it. How does it feel? I say, now taste it. And they would eat their popcorn. And some were like, I don't like popcorn. I was like, okay, don't eat it. Others were like, oh, popcorn is my favorite, right? So they experienced it with their eyes because they could see it when they opened it. They experienced it with their ears. They experienced it with touch. And then they experienced it with taste. Is If you engage all five senses in that way, what happens is that as each sense is interacting with whatever you're fixed on, one sense is heightened and the other is lessened until you change the focus and look at something different. Isn't that exactly what life is like? As we live through our life, we don't want to just be living through and not experience it. We want to live through it and experience every emotion, every feeling, every taste, every sight, and take it in the end. So as I'm reading this book, I have to tell you, like, everything I look at, getting in my car, looking at flowers in the driveway, I'm like, let me go look at that closer. Let me see what this looks like. And I'm reminded of my friend, Erin Ramsey. 
She has a lavender farm in Kentucky. And she told the story this week about loving pink flowers. And so she has a cut flower garden that she planted on her lavender farm. And at first, she would just pick all the pink flowers, which is a lot of work through cut flowers. But she said one day, she's like, why not just plant all pink flowers? I like to see them. And so now she has a section that's only pink flowers. So she can cut her full bouquet of these different array of flowers that are all pink and put them in there and really enjoy them. And it brings her joy. Isn't that us, right? Isn't that what life is all about? So I want to encourage you to re-engage this summer with your senses. Re-engage with the things that bring life to you and the things that bring you great joy. Some of us, that'll be really easy because we're like, oh, I have this running list in my head. I'm just going to write it down. But for others of us, it's going to be an act of discovery because we haven't spent enough time doing it. So I want to encourage you to do that. So make a list on a paper. This is your action step of your five senses. And you can just put it across the top, the five senses. And then on the left-hand side of the page, write down one thing you want to engage in. Like for me, I want to engage in the wonder of water. So that could be in the sprinkler, that could be in the pool, it could be drinking a refreshing um, water drink or beverage. And I want to find out how does each of my senses engage with that and just jot it down, right? It's a point of discovery. And if you discover as you're doing this all this month, if you discover that I'm not engaging my hearing very much, then do something that changes that trajectory. One of the things I started doing again was listening to music and singing along because I could hear my voice, I could hear the music, I could hear the instruments, and I started listening in a different way. And it just reawakened me in new ways. So that's a simple thing that you can do just to get started. And that's something that can be personal for you as well as you go forward. So that's what I want to invite you to do. Now, the last thing I want to share with you is that in the coming um, month, in August, we're going to be talking about routines. We're going to be talking about back-to-school tips and trips. And I want you to really hone in to starting a new, refresh year. But in the meantime, spend your summer enjoying one another, exploring new things, and really re-engaging your senses and your joy and your laughter so that when the routine of school gets back in gear, the busyness of school gets back in gear, then you can really say that I enjoyed my summer. Here's why. Here are some of the things that I did. And this is the joy that it brought me as I um, um, did it. So as I think about that, I think about we have to have balance in our life. And that balance needs to be in every area. And so throughout your day, just look at how am I feeling in my body? How much work did I do? How much fun did I have? Any pleasures that I had? And if it's off balance, just make the adjustment, really small adjustment, and then start again. And you can do that periodically through the day. So thank you for joining us today. Have an amazing summer. And we will see you back here in August, ready to start the new year, the new school year, get some routines and talk about those practical applications for life. Have a great one. Bye. This episode of In the Background of Life with Kelly Ramsey is brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform. 